Without further ado, uh, please welcome Dr. Eugene Waltering. Well, I, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. I, I, like everybody in this room, just absolutely miss Monica. I, last night, when somebody was taking my picture, I said, you're the wrong person. You're wrong person, totally. As, as we talk about medicine and as we talk about how we care for patients and how we as physicians get our own care, what we realize more and more is we don't want cookbook medicine. In, in the old days, I used to bitch and moan at, at myself and my colleagues that many of the protocols that we used for breast cancer, et cetera, went back to what I called cookbook chemotherapy. And that is one size fits all. If you're a woman who has a breast cancer and you're, you don't have any hormone receptors, this is what you're gonna get. Now, the, the dose will vary a little bit, but here's frontline therapy, here's second line therapy, here's third line therapy, and here are the national standards. And it, if your tumor wasn't sensitive to this chemotherapy, didn't make any difference, that's what you were offered because that's the way medicine was done. And I think we're going to see that change very dramatically in the next little bit. Well, how do you get optimum care? Well, first of all, you have to know your doctor. And, and I'm an acquired taste. If you come to see me, you have to know that I can't type. So I'll, I'll answer your email. Whether you can read it or not may be a totally different kind of thing. My brain goes at one speed, my fingers go at another speed, and if I answer 300 emails a day, I can't go back and, and do spell check and all that kind of stuff. It is what it is and it goes out and that's the way it is. The other thing is it's nice to have, and, and Dr. Warner and I were talking about this, it, it's nice to have a group of guys who work together on a day-to-day -day basis that can go and, and you can say, Fred, I got this complex patient, she's driving me crazy because I can't figure out what to do, and he gives you a new set of inputs into it. It's nice in my office because I have a gastroenterologist, I have a medical oncologist, I have a liver transplanter, I have a cancer surgeon, and now we have our own nuke med guy. And I can say, this is what I think about this Octrea scan. And Richard looks at me and said, yes, no, maybe. But I know that here's a guy who was president of the, the National Nuclear Medicine Society. He's not some Yahoo. Uh, off the street. Here's a guy who was, was there when they were inventing Octrea scans and has done this for years and years. People are going to make suggestions and sometimes you don't have to understand why I made a suggestion on what test. Sometimes I can explain it to you and sometimes you have to just trust that I or Dr. Warner or Dr. Odoricio or any of the people who, who do this only for a living have intuitions that something's brewing and I'll tell you we're going to talk about it a little later my current intuition is the neurokinin assay is going to tell us stuff that we don't know now like who needs changes in therapy right now and so those things are really important Ooh. tests that you need to have done to optimize the staging area of tumor well, you need to have right up front a complete battery of, of biochemical markers in both your blood and in your urine. You need your scans, and the scans we know now, I used to get CAT scans for everything and, and didn't use MRI scans hardly ever at all. And the reason was is I was looking for the wrong things in the wrong places. CAT scans do better in the mesentery, CAT scans do better in the chest, CAT scans do better a lot of places except in the liver. And there's where you want an MRI scan. And the beauty of the MRI scan is it can be done without iodine. It's not done without contrast, and the gadolinium contrast can still hurt your kidneys. So it's a, uh, MRI scans are a benefit for people who are iodine allergic, but they're not necessarily uh, a, a better deal for somebody who has bad kidneys. 
Octreotide scans are different than CAT scans and MRIs. I sort of make the analogy, one's a shotgun and the other is a, a hunting rifle. If you have an apple sitting on your head, which do you want me to shoot at it with? A 12-gauge shotgun or a sniper rifle? Well, I think the answer is pretty obvious. So if I want an answer about a liver, I use a test that looks at the liver, i.e. an MRI of the liver. If I want to scan your whole body, then I use, I use the shotgun approach, and the, and the Octrea scan is a shotgun approach. And then finally, Octrea scans look for somatostatin receptors. MIBG scans are, again, a shotgun approach, and if you use them early when you know you have tumor bulk, you may know later that uh, that is a good thing that is another potential therapy that we could put in the the mix. As you, those people who have heard me speak before, the, the key to a long-term sur survival in a casino at a blackjack table isn't to put all your money on the first bet. The trick is, is to win a little bit with each hand so that at night you go home with a big stack of cash. And that's called stacking, and it's like poker chips. If I buy you six months with this therapy, and a year with this therapy, and three years of tumor stability with this therapy, and I shrink your tumor with this therapy by a little bit, and I stabilize your tumor again, and I keep doing that, suddenly we look up and say, I've retired, you're old, and it's time for the box, but you had a great life in the meantime. Who? Who? Ah. Um, you got to know your doctor. You have to know his strong points and your limitations. If you have two guys in the, uh, in the office, Lowell Anthony and myself, if you want to ask a surgical question, it doesn't make sense to ask a medical oncologist. Likewise, if you're going to ask a, a, a very specific chemotherapy question, Lowell is far better qualified to answer that chemotherapy question than I am. So I have some strong points. Lowell has some strong points. Each of us have our own limitations in knowledge. And even if you have five surgeons in a room, Phil Boudreau looks at a problem from the point of view of a liver transplanter. Gene Waldering looks at the problem from the point of view of a cancer surgeon. And those two may be different viewpoints. And when I and we tell you to get things done, spend the time and effort to get them done, especially before you go to your expert opinion for the first time. If you're going to go to see Richard Warner, and you're going to take the time and effort to come to New York City and see the guy who's the guru, it is totally stupid to walk into Richard's office and not have your CAT scans, not have your blood work, not have your pathology, not have your op note, and have it all organized so you can hand it to him and say, here it is. Because if he has to spend two hours sorting through, literally I get 2,000 pages of stuff and it's not organized and it's not tabbed or anything else, I do that on your time. And if I got an hour allotted for you, by the time I'm done, you're angry at me, I'm angry at you, and we've accomplished nothing. Well, guys. Well, there are specific uh, biomarkers, and, and these biomarkers define specific things. Some biomarkers define what kind of tumor you have. If you have a tumor of the pancreas or of the stomach that makes gastrin, you're a gastrinoma of some kind or a zollinger ellison syndrome of some kind. Some biomarkers may tell you about tumor bulk and, and if measured sequentially, changes in tumor size. And some things that we'll talk about later, like neurokinin A, may be prognosis markers and may not be as sensitive at measuring changes in tumor volume, but may be the crystal ball that we look for on who's going to be alive in five years 
and who's not going to be alive in five years if we don't change your therapy. For those people who have nets of the pancreas, or islet cell tumors as they used to be called, there are functional and non-functional tumors. And functional tumors are tumors that make something, and the something they make, we know what that something does. Gastrin is the peptide that drives your stomach to make acid. If you have a gastrin-producing tumor, the first thing you have to check and know is the second part of the equation is gastrin's elevated, and the next question you have to ask is, is your gastrin, or is your acid level in your stomach up? If you take PPIs, you'll have an elevated gastrin, but you won't have any acid in your stomach, and that's how you differentiate between the tumor scenario in that case and the non-tumor scenario drug-induced achlorhydria or lack of acid in your stomach. Insulinoma uh, makes uh, insulin and C-peptide. Vipoma gives you diarrhea by making vasoactive intestinal peptide. And there are even tumors that make somatostatin. And you all know about sandostatin is a synthetic somatostatin. And it's based on what, what God would do. And markers are, are cool things. A, to measure the first time to try to figure out what you have. But much more important than that, serial measurements to, to assess changes in your clinical status and tumor growth. Well, let's talk about bio car, uh, markers for NETS for, that, that work for either pancreatic or islet cells. And those are things like chromogranin A. Chromogranin A, if you measure it every three months, will march along and in, by and large tell you that you're having changes in your tumor volume. If you're stable and your chromogranin was elevated, you have surgery, it came back down, and now it's staying stable, that's a good sign. If it was never up, you may not have that as a good biomarker for you. Pancreastatin is something that's just coming out. Dr. Odoricio has a paper that just got accepted to pancreas where he's going to compare people who have chromogranin values sequentially, what happens to them, and people who have pancreastatin values drawn on the same day. And what you'll see, and I have a few of them in here, is that chromogranin grows up, goes up slowly, and pancreastatin goes up like a rocket. And then in certain groups of people, you, like mid-gut carcinoids, Dr. Jess Ardell from Belfast, Ireland, has this neurokinin assay. And, and so what Jess says is there is a magic cutoff value. And if you have a neurokinin A that is over that, your chance of being alive in three years is 10%. 10%. If you have a, a marker value less than that, your chance of being alive in three years is like 87%. And we now are doing a study for the first time validating Dr. Ardell's assay in Belfast here in the United States with a company called ISI in California that most of you know. So what happened was is ISI sent 100 tubes of blood to Belfast so that we now have, have a, a comparison of California to Ireland. And then Dr. Ardell took 100 tubes of blood from Ireland and sent them to California, so we have the opposite comparison. And I can tell you, they are right on top of one another. What, what Dr. Ardell's assay sees is the same as what we see here in America. Well, biomarkers for carcinoid nets, well, serotonin as a marker of do you have the syndrome. If you're non-syndromic, if you have a hindgut, not very likely that you'll have serotonin. The other thing you need to know about serotonin is how the specimen is handled before it gets to the, the laboratory is really critical. It has to be put in a tube with preservatives. It should be put on ice. It should not be stuck in bright sunshine or heated up, et cetera. 
those are, it, it's much more sensitive to those kind of things than, than things like chromogranin. Uh, you have 5-HIAA, which is serotonin as your body excretes it, gets broken down and excreted by the kidneys. It is the metabolite of serotonin, and because of that, it averages out your serotonin for the whole day. Whereas serotonin tells you what your serotonin is when the needle went in your arm. When the needle comes out of your arm, if your serotonin went up 20 fold right after that, you missed it. There are other kinds of things like substance P. Well, substance P is probably more associated with people who have foregut, like lung or thymic or gastric tumors, than it is midgut carcinoid. It is also something that is interesting that goes up in pain. And now there's a very interesting study I just heard of where people who were on the ventilator and sedated and paralyzed so that they didn't fight the ventilator, they measured substance P values in. And those people who were inadequately sedated and remembered the experience, their substance P values were very high. Tom Odoricio, this is a true story, went to the Middle East during one of the, the uh, Jewish-Arab uh, interactions and worked with a group of Jewish surgeons on the forefront, and they measured substance P when things were peaceful, and then when the bullets started flying, they went and measured another substance P and the substance P value when the bullets were flying was off the top of the scale. So it measures things that, that may not be directly tumor related. Gastrin, we find them in the islet cell tumors of the pancreas called gastrinomas. We also find it in type 1 and type 2 gastric carcinoids. But there's a difference between type 1 and type 2 carcinoids. Type 1 carcinoid, you have elevated gastrin and no acid. Type 2 carcinoids, you have an elevated gastrin with boatloads of acid in your stomach. So we can tell what you have by making sure that the first question you got to answer if you have an elevated gastrin is, do you have acid in your stomach? And then we have things like histamine, bradykinin, which are very tough to, ma uh, to, to measure uh, as part of either lung or thymic carcinoids. And then finally, neurokinin A that we talked about. Remember, it's not the absolute concentration of a marker that you have to worry about. The, the, the deal is, is that you have to look at serial measurements. And we, do, we recommend biomarkers in the blood every three months for at least the first couple of years after you've had an intervention. And then we go to six months, and then after you've been out five or ten years, then we go to once a year. Remember chromogranin and pancreastatin. We said we were going to talk a little bit about why pancreastatin may be a way more valuable marker than chromogranin. Chromogranin is a molecule the size of the, of the Goodyear blimp. Pancreastatin is like the little gondola driver's compartment underneath the blip. It's a little piece of chromogranin. And because of that, chromogranin is measured in uh, nanograms, or 10 to the 12th units, and pancreastatin is in picograms. And there is a thousand-fold difference in pancreastatin and, and chromogranin just based on the assays and how they're reported. And, and just going to give you a little hint of Dr. Odoricio's paper. And this is a lady from Virginia who allows me to use her data. And basically, here is the, the serotonin value over time. And these are February 06, March, April, May, June, July, et cetera. And so we're measuring these values every three months. This is pancreastatin, chromogranin, 5-HIA, and serotonin. Which one tells you best 
what we're, what's going on with our tumor. Clearly, the pancreastatin is slowly but surely <laughs> creeping up, while the other values are pretty stable. Next is another indication. This is a gentleman from Arkansas. And again, the bottom two lines are, cro are chromogranin and 5-HIA. And the top line is pancreastatin. And these lines here represent surgery, debulking surgery. And this line here is when he stopped and changed his, his sandostatin analogs. And that his value actually starts going back up again. OK, well, what about Ardell and the neurocannon values? And this applies only to those people in the room that have mid-gut carcinoids. These are the ones that arise in the small bowel, either in the jejunum or the ileum. And basically, she says that neurokinin predicts your prognosis. It predicts if the, if the crystal ball says you're going to be here five years from now or not. And basically, her number is in picomoles. Our number here in America is in picograms per mil. The magic number in America is 55. If you're over 55, you need something done, and you need something done pronto. And if you're under 55, you have time. You're in a good prognosis group. And so again, what Jess Ardell showed was if you're in that bad group, your chance of being alive three years from now is 10%. So what is, is the hope is that she now says, what if you're in the bad group and I do something for you and your number comes back down? It was like you were never in the bad group. So it tells us, A, make a, make a, a change in therapy. Start measuring the neurokinin when you do that, and one of two things will happen. Either you'll stay in the bad group, and then you need another different therapy, or you go back into the good group, and then, then you uh, don't need uh, any additional ther or, uh, change in therapy. You can stay on that therapy now. Well, other things you need to have done on your tumor, pathology. And, and this sometimes requires you just sit going at, to the hospital where you had your surgery, going down to the pathology office, and sitting there and saying, look, I'd like to meet with the pathologist who looked at my slides. Here's my pathology report. His name's on the bottom. And I'd like to talk to him. And I'd like to say, I'd like these stains done. And these stains can be done either at this hospital or would you package them up and let's send them to a, a commercial company like Genzyme who, who does these kind of stainings every day on slides for anybody who sends them in. Not only do you want to know is your KI67 positive or negative, but you want a number. You want to know the percent of cells that are actively dividing at the moment the tissue was fixed, and that's called a KI-67. It's an indicator of how fast your tumor is doubling. The other two things, chromogranin and synaptophysin, most times you will see, yes, they're positive or no, they're negative, but that's not what you want to know. What you want to know is what percent of the cells are positive or negative, and that gives you information on how well differentiated your tumor is and the more you look like your mother and father, the better behaved you are if you're a tumor. If you're having a new biopsy or surgery, there are other tests that you need to have done. These can be done on old tissue. But to do some of the things that I'm about to talk to you about, you have to have fresh tumors. So if you have surgery 10 years ago and you don't have anything, to, uh, an easy place to get this, this may not apply to you. And these are chemo resistance testing and chemo sensitivity testing. Dr. Warner and I just wrote a paper where we went and looked at the chemo resistance testing. And this is usually paid for by Medicare. Most insurance companies cost about $3,500 and tells you, is your tumor resistant 
to the, the chemotherapy that we might give you in the future. Chemosensitivity is the opposite side of that coin, but, but approaches the problem from, the, from dark, the dark side of the moon versus the light side of the moon. The angiogenesis testing I'm going to talk about, we do in our lab, we do for free. You send us the tumor, you get it there, we'll do it, send you back the results, it doesn't cost a penny. Doing uh, tumor extractions for biomarkers. This is new. We just are starting to do this in our, our uh, assay or in our lab. We do the extraction for free, and then we send it to ISI, and you get a bill from ISI to run the pancreastatin and the chromogranin and stuff. And then what else we're doing is we now have a bank of tumor tissue that we're cryopreserving. Notice I didn't say freezing. Freezing kills tissue. Putting it in formaldehyde kills tissue. Heating it up and cooking it kills it. We take fresh tissue, we chop it up, we make it go into suspended animation, and then we can keep it in a bank for years and years and years and years, and then wake it up if there's a new test that requires growing tissue. And we do that for free. Freshly harvested tumor, you need to send it to us on wet ice. It can't come frozen, it can come on dry ice. It has to come on wet ice in tissue culture media. We'll send you the tubes. We take those and we put it in a jello-like matrix and we watch how it grows blood vessels. It, you can uh, also take that stuff in a jello-like matrix and see how, if you can kill the tumor cell or the blood vessel, both, and we'll talk about both. If your tumor in one of these assays is sensitive to chemotherapy, these are called drug sensitivity testing, it means that you have about a 65% chance of responding to that chemo if we gave it to you. Drug resistance testing, which is what Dr. Warner and I do, says this drug won't work and if we did it, you have a 95% chance of getting sick with no benefit to your tumor. So that, that's a very different approach, but it tells you the same kind of thing. It tells you what to use, and maybe more importantly, what not to use. If you've had tumor completely resected, and we evaluate this tissue, we don't throw away that data. We keep it in our, the back of our heads in the notebook and say, five years from now you recur. Here's going to be the plan for five years from now. Here's what you were. Here's the sensitivity. Here's the resistance. Here are the biomarkers. Here are the receptors. And coming up shortly, here are the genes that your primary tumor, your lymph node, or your liver metastasis have. If you have residual disease following surgery, we use the information right now to craft a personalized plan of treatment. Chemo resistance is, is either low, intermediate, or high. Same kinds of things for sensitivity. When Dr. Warner and I looked at a, a, over 100 people that he and I had sent to get this testing done, what are the agents that popped up most likely to succeed? 5-FU, adriamycin, atoposide, and tenozolomide, or timidar. So those are, if we were going to guess what to treat you with and didn't have uh, tissue, those would be in my top list. And you'll hear a lot about Zolota, which is 5-FU, and timidar, which is the oral form of tenozolomide. And so a lot of people get five days on, and then the weekend off of Zolota, and then seven days a month they get Timidar. And that, those are common things that we would do for carcinoid patients. Well, what is, what is the assay that we're talking about? Well, the thing you've got to know is tumors can't grow beyond the size of a BB unless they have a new blood supply. A BB gets diffusion of oxygen and glucose and, and all the things it needs by simple diffusion when it's little teeny tiny. 
but when it gets beyond the size of a BB, it now needs new blood vessels to either bring it oxygen, bring it food, and just as importantly, to get rid of the metabolic waste products. If you can prevent blood vessel growth, you can prevent tumor growth. And you, you can do information from this in three ways. If you've had all your tumor removed, preventing new blood vessel growth may limit new tumor growth to less than two millimeters. Never been shown in a human being, but it has been shown in mice. If you have widespread tumor, it just may put it in a state of suspended animation. God willing, you could have tumor regression because if you can kill off blood vessels. There are two kinds of angiogenic agents. Cytostatic agents that just keep, you can't make any new blood vessels, and cytocytal agents that kill off the blood vessels that are already there. And if you kill off blood vessels, you also block the exit pathways for tumor cells to spread from your primary tumor to your liver or from your primary tumor to bone, etc. What do we do once we get your tumor? We chop it up. They, the, the guys in my lab, when we started doing this, called me Dr. Ginsu. He chops, he slices, he dices. The tumor is then cultured in a thing that's like a blood clot without blood. And then over time, we look for new blood vessel growth at 7 and 14 days. And this is a picture of a well that looks like a barrel. This is the blood clot kind of stuff with a piece of tumor or blood vessel in it. And then this is a liquid media that you can put any drug in it you want, or no drug at all. The assay can help you in three ways. It can be set up as a standard battery, which we do against everybody's tumor. And we do about 15 different drugs against your tumor's blood vessels. We can use a custom set of, of things in cooperation with your doc. If he has a specific drug he wants to test that he's hot on, or we can do natural products. We have a lot of people in the room who have come to me and said, you know, I'm not going to take, you know, drug X from Big Pharma Y, but I might take black raspberry powder, ground up fruit, or a combination thereof. For industry, we can take industry's pipeline drugs, and we're going to show you Novartis's pipeline in a minute, or we can just take for patients and say, this is what works in you. And this is an example of a tumor of one of our patients. We take the OR, and these are all the different drugs that, that we test. And we look at the green stuff up above, what percent of the tumor chunks that we put in culture begin to grow? And the red lines, how much do they grow? And the blue lines are the overall effect of this drug on angiogenesis. So this is a really good drug. This is not such a hot drug. This is a really good drug. This is a really good drug. Notice what they were, Chinese sweet leaf tea. Apophyllone, which is one of the Novartis drugs that is a, a, a tubulin inhibitor. We have Gleevec here, we have PTK, and then we have gallic acid, which is a food preservative, and these are our controls. Well, what about testing your drug or your tumor against drugs that are the latest, hottest things from industry? before we give them to you. In other words, it makes real good sense to me that, that your tumor, if I make your tumor sick, I'm sorry, but who cares? If I make you sick, that's a whole course of a different color. And so these are things that are in the Nevada pipeline when we started this, Affinitor Rad001 now out on the market as a successful <laughs> drug. Others like PTK getting sold off, Gleevec is, is for just tumors, but we put it in there for grins, and guess what? It's an active thing. You'll hear about SOM230, the new hot somatostatin analog. Maybe you want to look at this data before you consider switching to a different analog. And then Apophlone B, uh, one of the tubulin inhibitors like Taxol. 
Well, this is Gleevec, and, and the top line represents 44 patients whose tumors we tested. These are the tumors, and these are untreated. And then down here, point by point, are the results when we treated this, these cells, or these tumor fragments with Gleevec. And this gives you an, this shows you the slope of the group, and says this is an active drug. But it says for this person, it's really active. And this person, it's, it's OK active. And this person, or this person here, it's not really super duper active. So it's, it tells you where the herd is going, which is what most clinical trials tell you. 20% of people responded. That's what this tells you. But this tells you out of the, that herd, yes or no, your tumor is a good deal. And here's another drug. This is the new somatostatin analog. And notice the lines from control to treated are identical. So it had no anti-angiogenic effect. And if you were this person right here, your treated angiogenesis is worse than the untreated. So you don't want to go on that drug. So that may be a very important piece of information. This is PTK787. This is one of the, the kinase drugs, sort of like some of the Sutent drugs. And again, the, the lines represent the, the, the whole group, and the little dots are untreated, and the triangles are tissue matched treated groups. And again, 40 some people, and you can see that in general, just the way this looks, this, you may never have to test this drug again because everybody responds, basically. Or at least the first 40 do. And then this is RAD001 that just made it to the market. Again, this is about a 19% difference between the untreated and the treated controls. <coughs> and, but for some people, again, the drug's not a great choice, and other people, it's really good, and in some people, again, no real help at all. And to know where you fall in this may be critical over time. Again, a drug that just kicks butt and takes names. Apophlone B, a drug very much like Taxol, has been used in, in women with breast cancer who fail Taxol. 40% of them respond to this drug right here. And again, everybody responded in, in our culture, and we just now have a, a, a manuscript that's out there that shows that low doses of apophlone given every day for protracted periods of time called metronomic dosing is equally uh, successful. Well, if you look, uh, just this is a busy slide. But the bottom line is over here. This is what we're projecting as responses. For RAD, we're, we're projecting a response of about 19%. For SOB 230, about 2%. And these other drugs, uh, a much higher percent uh, for the overall herd. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. What are you measuring in this angiogenic Are you measuring tumor growth? No, measuring blood vessels. Purely. And you tested the, the uh, SOM230. Correct. Which is really not an angiogenesis inhibitor. That is correct. That. That's right. So you can't really dismiss that drug outright. For its effect as an angiogenesis inhibitor. Yes, but not as an effect against carcinoids in general. As you, as you know, I, all I'm caring about is, is I'm not well, talking I'm about not symptom control. Right. Yeah, it is. It, that, that's a good point. It's octreotide was never marketed for its effect on tumor growth. Nobody has ever said from Novartis to you, if they did, the FDA would break all their bones, that, that this drug will inhibit tumor growth. But as we all know, the PROMIT study showed exactly that when, when used in a randomized prospective trial. But yes. As, as you may or may not know, 
1990, we were the first group that showed that the somatostatin analogs, BIM23014, lanreotide, vaporeotide, octreotide, all inhibited angiogenesis. What's different with SOM230 is SOM230 doesn't inhibit angiogenesis, and that makes it a very different choice than, than other people. But as a drug for symptom control. Not, not interested in not symptom problem. control. Not my problem. I want to make that clear. Right. Yeah, not, not, not making these choices to, to make you have less bowel movements. I think there are better ways to do that. Anyhow, black raspberry extract, a lot of people have talked about this. This was a, an idea that came up with a guy named Gary Steiner from Ohio State in cooperation with Stokes Berry Farm in Ohio. And they showed that for Barrett's esophagus and head and neck cancers that these, that exposure to the black raspberry, that people survived longer and that they actually had regression of, of what's called the oral def uh, field defect that, that uh, had with the head and neck cancers. What we showed using higher doses than they did is that the black raspberry would stop blood vessel growth. It's not useful topically because it stains you purple. If you've ever seen a piece of meat in the butcher's uh, uh, shop, that seal that's purple, is black raspberry juice. If you get it on your skin, you will never get it off. You will be a one-eyed, one or fine purple people eater. And, but here it is, and, and this is how we start in every case. We, we talk about blood vessels, and we then use dose response curves to figure out what is achievable in human beings. And as you can see, the, the blue line is its overall effect. The more you use, the, the more effect it has. And remember, this is nothing more than freeze-dried black raspberries. Not extracted, no magic potions done to it. It's fruit ground up and made into a powder. And these are 70 people whose tumors we evaluated in, in out of our group. And as you can see, there are people who have a profound effect on their tumor. And then we have people who probably shouldn't spend $20 a day on this kind of, of medicine or fruit. So again, in this particular case, if you were interested in doing something like black raspberry, I wouldn't just go out and do it willy-nilly. I would do it in a case where we have some evidence that it's going to do something for you. We have our first NIH grant. It's for Chinese sweet leaf tea. This is not green tea. It's not black tea. It is a special tea that's grown in a very small area in China for poor people because it contains something called rubicides. And rubicides are like saccharin. It's a way to get sweet tea without having to buy sugar. The problem is that you call it sweet, I call it bitter. It is really nasty tasting stuff. Uh, we're working to try to get rid of the nasty taste while, while maintaining the potency. We think we may be there. Um, we don't know. But we, we have 13 people who have been on this as part of a clinical trial. And, and we've had no side effects at all, so that, that's a good thing. This is, again, uh, our analysis of, of these kind of people. And again, it's a drug much more like apophalone than Gleevec or SOM230 in that everybody's tumor who we tested against has really been sensitive to this. And then we use these assays to help out other investigators. Dr. Herb Chen is an investigator at the University of Wisconsin. And one of the most common anti-seizure medicines used in America is a medicine called valproic acid. It's on the market. You can go buy it today, tomorrow, whatever. Has a very nice side effect profile. But more importantly, you can stick out your blood at your arm any, at any vampire state in the, in the union, have a tube of blood drawn, and, and two days later, they tell you how much of it is in your blood 
So we know that you match where we are uh, on our testing, and we think that's really Im uh, important. And again, don't, don't look at me and, and uh, think I did this work. The clinical work here came from the University of Wisconsin, Dr. Herb Chen, who's head of their Department of Surgery. What we did was, was independent of Herb based on his work, and now we're working on a collaborative NIH grant that we're trying to get. But again, the blue line now represent the controls. The red lines represent the treated groups. And again, people who ought not to go on the drug, and other people <coughs> that it looks like it has a, a really profound effect. To tell you how much I believe in this, my mom went on valproic acid. She's had no side effects, and so far, so good. The overall theoretic uh, slope differences are about 60%. We think we can pick out of these assays people who are super responders and people who don't respond very well. And, and we do this all by testing your tumor, not by giving you something that makes you sick and say, six months from now we'll know whether or not this did anything for you. Oh, by the way, your hair fell out, your eyebrows fell out, uh, but you know, we, we'll ignore that therapy. Uh, what do you need to do to get personalized care? Get your biomarkers done up front at diagnosis and then at sequential intervals, get the appropriate testing done on your tumor. Ask for it. If they don't do it, jump up and down, scream, hold your, your breath, act like a blueberry, and, and, and sit there and, and get your pathologist to work with you. Get the appropriate scans done, and then be smart. Get your second opinion first. Go to people who care about neuroendocrine tumors. Talk to them on the phone. Talk to them on email. Make an appointment. Go, uh, go see them. But these, uh, these people can work with your local docs. I'm not saying that your no local doc is not a good guy. I'm saying that he does, like Dr. Gerstein said, work in the trenches. He takes care of all kinds of cancer. I take care of one kind of cancer. And I think I have a different perspective about what I do than he does. On the other hand, he can do all those things that I just said, and we can work together better than I can do it by myself or he can do it by himself. The future, we're, we're going to have extracting your tumors for biomarkers and receptors. Uh, we're going to offer cryopreservation of your tumor. Put some of your tumor in suspended animation. I don't know what's coming but I'll be ready to test it for you, and we think we can do this at, at a relatively inexpensive price that you can pay for, and it won't break the bank. Uh, testing a tumor which, uh, to tell you which receptors are present, Dr. Uh, Warner is doing this. We think that not only do we need to tell you yes or no you have a receptor, but how much of that receptor and then finally, gene testing to tell you the specific pathways that we need to stimulate or block to, to get your tumor growth turned on or off. And, and that's independent, again, of, of symptom control. Again, what we're talking about today is purely tumor growth and blood vessel growth. And then this is my new official. You know, Komen has the run for the cure. They, they have a very fast-growing tumor. So we're going to crawl for the cure, we're, but we're going to have our own uh, little mascot here. Uh, we need to name him. So anybody who comes up with a great name for the, the net snail, the zebra snail, as you were, um, let me know. Thank you very much. And again, we'll uh, be happy to take questions during the question and answer room.